The Vocabulary of Change From a 21st century vantage point, calculus is often seen as the mathematics of change. It quantifies change using two big, con two big concepts, derivatives and integrals. Deriv derivatives model rates of change and are the main, op the main topic of this chapter. Integrals, mo integrals model the accumulation of change and will be discussed in chapter 7 and 8. Derivatives, derivatives answer the case, question like how fast, how steep, how sensitive. These are all questions about rate of, rates of change in one, in one form of or, or another. A rate of change means a change in the dependent variable divided by a change in an independent in uh, the independent variable in symbols a rate of change always takes the form uh, always takes the form delta delta y over delta over delta y over delta x a change in y a change in y divided by a change of in x sometimes other letters are used but the structure is the same for example when time is the independent variable it's customary and clearer to write the, the rate to write the rate of change as delta y delta t where, where t denotes time. The more familiar, the more fam, the most familiar example of a rate is a speed. When we say when we say a car is going 100 km an hour, the number qualifies as a rate of change because it defines as defines speed as a delta y delta t. When it states how far the car, the car goes, delta y equals 100 kilometers in a given amount of time, delta t equals one, one hour. Likewise, acceleration is a rate. It's defined as the rate of change of st or speed, usually written delta v, delta t, where v stands for velocity, where the American car manufacturer self wallet claims that one of these muscle cars. The V8 Camaro SS can go from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 4 seconds, four seconds flat. They are coating, decoding acceleration as a rate. A change in speed from 0 to 60, to 60 miles per hour divided by change in times in time, 4 seconds. The slope of, of a ramp is a third example of a rate of change. It's defined as the ramps vertical rise delta y divided by its horizontal run delta x. A steep ramp has a large slope. A wheelchair accessible ramp is required by US law, US law to have a slope at less than 1 over 12. Fair ground has zero slope. Of all the various steps of change that exist, the slope of, of a curve in xy plane is the most important and useful because it can stand in in fact, all the rest, depending on what y, x, and y represent, the slope of a curve can indicate a speed, an acceleration, a rate of pay, and a change and the same rate. The marginal return on a, a marginal return on an investment or any other kind of rate. For example, when we plotted the number of calories y contained in x slices of cinnamon raisin bread, the graph was a line with a slope of 200 calories of per slice. The slope, a, geometri a geometrical feature, told us that told us the rate at which the bread delivers calories, a nutritional feature. Similarly, on a graph of distance versus time of a moving car, the slope indicates the car's speed. Thus, the slope is a, is a sort of universal rate. Since any function of one variable can always be graphed as a, as a curve on the xy plane, we can find its change. We can find its rate of change by reading off the slope of this graph. The catch is the rates of change are rarely constant in the real world or in mathematics. In that case, defining a rate becomes problematic. The first big issue in this in differential calculus is to define what we what we mean by the rate when the rate of change keep changing. Speedometers and GPS devices have solved this problem. They always know that they always know what speed to report 
if a car speeds up and slow down how this how do this gauge do it what calculation are they making with calculus we see we'll see just as speed do not need do not need to be constant slopes do not be do not need to be constant either on a curve like a cycle or parabola or any other smooth path as long as it's not a perfectly straight line the slope is bound to be steeper in one in some places and slow solo solo works solo work in others that's true in the real world too mountain trails have treasures steep exceptions and restful flat sections so the question mean, remains how do we find the how do we define the slope when the slope keeps changing the first thing to realize is that we need to expand our concept of what a rate of change is in algebra in algebra problems that that involve distance equal e equals rate times ta, equal rates time ta, times time the rate is always a constant that is not the case in calculus because speeds slopes and other rates and other rates vary as the independent variable x or t changes they have to be regarded as, func as, function as functions themselves. Rate of change can no longer be mere numbers. They need to become functions. That is what the concept of derivative does for us. It defines a rate of change as a function. It specifies, uh, it specifies a rate at a given point or at a given time, even if that rate is variable. In this chapter, we'll see how derivatives are defined what they mean and why they matter. To let the cat out of the bag, derivatives, ma derivatives matter because they are ubiquitous. At their, at their deep, deepest level, the laws of nature are expressed in terms of derivatives. It's as, it's as if the universe we know, knew about rates of change before we did. At a more mundane level, derivatives come up whenever we want to quantify how, how a change in something is related to a change in something else how much does raising the price of an app affect the consumer depend for it how much does increasing the dose of a statin drug enhance its ability to lower a patient's low cholesterol or increase its risk of triggering side effect, effects like liver damage whenever we study a relationship of any kind we want to know if one variable change, how much does a related variable change, and in what rate in and in what direction up and down? These are questions about derivatives. The acceleration of rocket ship, the growth of rate of a population, the marginal return in on an investment, the temp the temperature gradient in a bowl of soup. Derivatives, one and all, in calculus. The symbol, of, the symbol for derivative is dy over dx. It's supposed to remind you of, of an ordinary rate of change, delta y over delta x, except that the two changes dy and dx are now, are now imagined to be infinitesimally teeny. That's a wide idea that will work, that will work our way up to slowly and gently, though it should not come as a surprise. We know, we, we know from the infinity, princip infinity principle that the way to make progress on complicated problems is to chop them into infinitesimally, infinitesimal bits, analyze the bits, and then put the bits back together to find the answer. The little changes dy and dx are those infinitesimal bits in the context of differential calculus. Putting them back together is the job. Of integral calculus the three center problems of calculus to prepare ourselves for what lies ahead we need to have a big picture in mind for the start there are three central problems in calculus they are shown schematically in on the diagram below one the fourth problem given a curve find its slope everywhere two the backward, the backward problem Given a curve slope if we were, find the curve. 3. The area, the area problem. Given a curve, find the area under it.
Here diagram shows the graph of a generic function yx. I haven't said what x and y represent because it doesn't matter. The picture is completely general. It shows a curve in the plane. That curve could represent any function of one variable and so could apply to any branch of mathematics or science where such function arise, which is essential if we were. The significance of its slope and area will be explained later. For now, just think of them as what they are, a slope in an area. The kind of this the kind of thing that geometers would know would worry out. We can view this curve in two ways, one old and one new. The in the early seventeenth century, before calculus arrived, such curves such curves were viewed as geometrical objects. They were considered fascinating in their own right. Mathematicians wanted to quantify their geo geometrical properties. Given a curve, they wanted to be able to figure out the slope of its tangent line, and at each point, the arc length of the curve, the area beneath the curve, and so on. In the 21st century, we are most we are we are more interested in the function that produces the curve, which models such not some natural phenomenon or technological process. process that manifested itself in the curve. The curve is data, but something deeper can analyze it. Today, we think of the curve as footprints in the sand, a clue to the process that made it. The that process, modeled by a function, is what we are interested in, not the trace it's, it left behind. This collision between, this, between these two points of, of view is how the mystery of curves collided with the mysteries of motion and change. It's how ancient geometry collided with modern science. Even though we are we are in the in modern times now, I've chosen to draw the picture from the older perspective because the XY plane is so familiar. It offers the clearest way to grasp the th to grasp the th three central problems of calculus, because all three can be readily visualized when we post them in geometric terms. The same ideas can also be reformulated in terms of motion of ch and change using dynamical ideas like speed and distance instead of curves and slope, but we will do that later once we have a better grasp on the geometry. The questions should be interpreted in the sense of functions. In other words, when I speak about the slope of the curve, I do not just mean at one specific point, I mean at the arbitrary point x. The slope changes as we move along the curve. Our goal is to understand how it changes as a function of x. Similarly, the area under the curve depends on x. I've shown it shaded in grey and labeled it with symbol ax. That, uh, that area should also be regarded as a function of x. As we increase x, the vertical dashed line slides to the right and the area expands, so the area depends on which x we choose. This, the, this then are the, are the three central problems. How can we feature out the changing, the changing slope of curve? How we can reconstruct a curve from its slope? And how can we feature out the, of the, feature out the changing area beneath the curve? As phrased in the context of geometry, the questions might sound pretty dry. But once we reinterpret, the, reinterpret them in the real world from the 21st century point of view, from the 21st century point of view as, as problems about motion and change, they become phenomenal, phenomenally wide reaching. So, slopes, measure, slopes measure rates of change, area measure the accumulation of change. As such, Slopes and areas are raised in every field, physics, engineering, finance, medicine, you name it, anywhere that change is an abiding concern. Understanding the problems and their solutions opens up the universe of modern quantitative thinking, at least about functions of one variable. For the sake of full disclosure, I should mention there, there is much more, there is much more to calculate than, than that. There are functions of many variables, many variables, differentials, differential equations, and the like. 
all in good time. We'll get to those later. This chapter is concerned with functions of one variable and their derivatives, the rate of change, starting with functions that change at a constant at a constant rate, and then, and then moving on the notier issue of functions that change at changing rate. That's where different that's where differential calculus really shines in making sense of every changing change. Once we gotten comfortable with rates of change, we'll be ready to tackle the accumulation of change, the most challenging topic of the next chapter. There is will be a refilled that the forward problem and the backward problem, as different as, as different as they seem, are twins separated at birth. A soccer called the fundamental theorem of calculus it revealed that rates of change and the accumulation of change are much more closely related than anyone had suspected a discovery a discovery that unified the two halves of calculus but first let's begin at the beginning with rates linear functions and their constant rates Many situations in everyday life are described by linear relationships in which one variable is proportional to another. For example, last summer, my old daughter Lea got her job at a clothing store in the mall. She earned, she, she earned ten dollars an hour. So, when she worked for two hours, she made twenty dollars. More generally. When she worked 40 hours, she made y dollars, where y equals 10t. A car drives down the highway at, at 60 miles per hour. Thus, after one hour, it goes 60 miles. After two hours, it goes 120 miles. After the hours, it goes 60, 60, t, 60 t miles. The reason ship here is y equals 60t, where y is the number of miles driven in the hours. According to the, American with the, America, according to the Americans with, disability X, with Disabilities Act, a wheelchair accessible ramp must not rise by more than 1 inch per every 2 inches of horizontal run. For a, for a ramp with this maximum permissible gradient, the relationship between rise and run is y equal x over 12 where y is the rise and x is the run slope equals ra rise over run in each of these linear relationships the dependent variable changes at a constant rate with respect to with respect to in independent variable my daughter my daughter's rate of pay was constant was a constant one hundred one thousand dollar one was constant ten dollar per hour. The car speed is constant sixty miles per hour, and the wheelchair accessible ramp has a constant slope defined as the defined as it as its rise over run equals one over twelve. The same is true. The same is true of the cinnamon raisin bread. I like to eat. It delivers calories. At a constant at a constant rate of 200 calories per slice. In the technical jargon of calculus, a rate always means a question of two changes: a change in y divided by a change in x, written in symbol at the y delta y delta y delta y over delta x. For example, if I eat two more slices of a bread, I pack on another. 100 calories. Thus, the corresponding rate is delta y over delta x equals 4 ca for, uh, for, 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 for 400 calories over 2 slices, which simplifies to 1,100 calories per slice. No, no surprise there. But what's interesting to observe is that this rate is constant. It's the same no matter how many slices I've been or I've already eaten. What a rate is constant is tempting to think of it as simply be uh, simply being a number like 200 calories per slice or 10 an hour, 
ten dollars an hour for or a slope of one o one over twelve. That cause no harm here, but it would get us into trouble later. In more complicated situations, rates will not be constant. For example, consider a walk through a rolling landscape where some parts of hike are steep and other flats and others are flat. On a rolling landscape, slope is a function of is a function of position. It will be a mistake to think of it. As a, as a mere number. Likewise, when a car accelerates or when a planet orbits the sun, its speed changes incessantly. Then it's, a, it's, a, it's vital to regard speed as a function of time. So we should get it. So we should get in that habit now. We should stop thinking of rates of change and numbers. Rates are functions. The potential confusion arises because the rate functions are constant for the linear relationships we've been considering. That's why it does no harm to treat them as numbers in a linear context. They do not change as, as we change the independent variable. My daughter's rate of pay is $10, hour, $10 an hour no matter how much she works and the slope of the RAM is 1 over 12 if we work along its length. But don't let that fool you. Those rates are still functions. They just happen to be they just happen to be constant functions. The graph of a constant function is a flat time, flat line, as shown here for the cinnamon raisin bread with its constant payload of 200, 200 calories per slices per slice. When we deal in the next section is in with a relationship that is not linear. We will see that it generates a curve, not a line, when graph, when, when graph in the xy plane. Either way, a line of a curve always reveals a lot, a lot about the relationship that, that produces it. It's like a relationship smoke, short or other. It's a clue that reveals that we, we made it. Notice the, distinction, notice the distinction between a function and the graph of the function. A function is a disembodied, disembodied rules, rule that eats x and spit out y, and that's not so uniquely for one x for each y, for one one y for each x. In that sense, a function is incorporeal. There's nothing to look at when you look at a function. It's a ghostly entity, an abstract rule. For example. The rule might be fed me a number and I will return 10 times the number. By contrast, the graph of a function is, is a visible, almost a tangible thing, except you can see. Speci specifically, the graph of function I just described would be aligned to the origin with a slope of 10 defined by the equation y equals, y equals 10x. But the function itself is not the line. The function is the rule that produces the line. To make a function manifest itself, you need to feed it an x, let it spit out a y, and repeat and repeat that for all, for all x and prove the results. When you do that, the function it the function itself stays invisible. What you are seeing is is its graph, a nonlinear function and its change rate. And a function is not linear. It's the y of delta x is not constant. In the geom in geometrical terms, that means the graph of the function is a curve with a slope that changes from from a point to point. As an example, consider the parabola shown below. It's the curve of y equals x squared, which corresponds to the simplest nonlinear button on the calculator, the square function x squared. This example will give us some practice with the definition of derivative as the slope of tangent line and also clarify why limits and target and why limits and target and target definition. Inspecting that the inspecting the parabola, we see that some parts of it are steep 
and some part are relative and some parts are relatively flat. The flattest part of all of all are curves at the bottom of the parabola at the point where x equals zero. Then we can see without doing any work that the that the derivative must be zero. It has to be zero because the tangent line at the bottom is evidently as the as axis. Field as a ramp, the line is no rise and all run and hence has a slope of zero. But at other points of the parabola, it, it's not immediately obvious what the slope of the tangent line should be. In fact, it, it not, it's not obvious at all. To figure it, let's to figure it out. Let's do an Einstein style to the experiment. Only imagine what we would see if we could zoom it. If we if if we could zoom in on arbitrary point x y on the parabola, as if we were making photograph enlargements of that point, always keeping it in the center of of, of our field of view. It's like we're looking at a piece of the curve under a microscope and increasing the magnification progressively. As we zoom in closer and closer, the piece of the parabola should begin to look straighter and straighter. If the limit of the if the limit of infinite magnification, which amounts to zoom in, to zooming in on to zooming in on an infinitesimal piece of the curve around the point of interest, the magnified species the bit the magnified piece should cross a straight line. If it does, the limiting straight line is defined as a tangent line at the point of the curve, and its slope is defined as derivative there. Noting that we are using the infinity principle here, we are trying to make a complicated curve simpler by chopping it into infinitesimal straight pieces. This is what we always do in calculus. Curve shapes are hard, straight shapes are easy, even if there are infinitely many of them and even if there are infinitesimally small, calculating a derivative in, the, in this way, a quintessential, quintessential, quintessential calculus move, move and on and one of the most fundamental applications of the infinity principle. To conduct the, two, the thought experiment, we need to select a point on the curve to zooming in on. Any point will do, but a numerically convenient choice is the point that lies on the parabola above x equals half. In this, in the diagram above, I've marked that. I've marked. I've marked that point with a dot. In the xy plane, it lies at. Or in decimal point. The reason that y equals a quarter at this point is that in order to to qualify uh, as a point on the parabola on the parabola the po the point must obey y equals x squares x square as all points on the parabola do after all this is what defines on the uh, this is what defines a point as a member of the parabolic curve if x equals half the point must have y value of now we now we are ready to zoom in to zoom in on the point of interest. Place the point x place the point x y equals 0, 0 0.5 point 0 0.5 0 0.25 at the center of the microscope. With the help of computer graphics, zooming in zooming in on a little piece the, of the curve surrounding the point. The the, the first magnification is shown, is shown here. The overall, the, overall, the overall shape of the parabola is lost in this magnified view. Instead, we just see a slight curve arc. This small piece, this small piece of parabola, which lies, which like which lies between x equals 0 0.3 and 0 0.7, appears a lot less curve than the parabola as a whole. Zooming in further by blowing up the piece, the piece between x equal 0.49 and 0.51. This new enlargement looks even straighter than the last one did, though it's not truly straight since it's still a portion of the parabola.
that the kind is clear as we keep zooming in the pieces look stated by measuring the rise over run delta y over x this for this almost straight piece and zooming in closer and closer we are effectively taking the limit of the pieces slope delta y over delta x as delta x goes to zero the computer graphics strongly suggest that the slope of this almost straight line is getting closer and closer to one corresponding to a line at the 45 degree angle with a bit of algebra we can prove that the limiting stop is exactly one in chapter 8 we'll see how such calculations are done furthermore performing the same calculation at any x not just at, not just at x equal 1 over 2 refers that the limiting slope and hence the slope of the tangent line equals to x at any point x y on the parabola or in the lingo of calculus the derivative of x squared is 2x tempting as it is to prove this derivative rule before moving on for now let's accept it and see what it means for one thing it say that at the dot where x equal a half the slope so the slope should equal to x equals two times a half equals one we which is which is just what we saw in the computer graphics it also predicts that at the bottom of the parabola at x equals zero the slope should be two times zero which is zero and we've already seen that the correct to that's correct too finally the 2x formula predicts that the slope that the slope should increases increase as we ascend the par the parabola to the right when x get big gets bigger the slope equals to x should also also get bigger which means the parabola should get steeper and it does our, our experiment our experiment with the parabola helps us understand a couple of caveats about calculus about derivatives a de derivative is defined only if a curve approaches a, a limiting straight line if we zooming in on it that won't be the case for certain pathological curves for example if a curve have, has a v-shape with a sub corner at one point then we zoom in on that point it will it continue to like a corner the corner never goes away no matter how much we sonify the curve it, it will be it will never glue straight here before of this the v-shape curve does not have a well-defined tangent line or a slope at the corner and hence it does not have a derivative there however when a curve does, does look increasingly straight when we zoom in on it sufficiently at any point the curve is said to be smooth throughout this book I have been assuming that the curves and process of calculus are smooth just as the early pioneers did in modern calculus however we have learned how to cope with the curves that are not smooth the inconveniences and pathologies of non-smooth curves something sometimes arise in applications due to sudden jumps or other discontinuities in the behavior of a physical system for example when we flip as when you flip a suddenly flowing significant significantly a graph of current of a, a graph of current versus time will show an a, a graph almost vertical rise approximate by a discontinuous jump as the current as the current turns turn, turns on sometimes it's more convenient to model that abrupt transition as a truly discontinuous jump in which case the current as a function of time will have derivative at the moment the switch flip. much of the first course in calculus in high school or college is devoted to calculating derivative schools derivative rules like the one about the, like the one above for x square but for the other buttons on the calculator like the derivative of sin x equals cos x, cos x or derivative of, of ln x equals 1 over x 
for our purposes however it's more important to understand the idea of the derivative and to see how its abstract definition applies in practice for that let's turn to, to the real world derivatives as a rate of change of the length in chapter 4 we look at the da we look at data on since seasonal change of the length although our purposes at the time was to illustrate I was to illustrate ideas about scene waves co-fitting and that data compression we can now repurpose those data to illuminate variable rates of change and bring derivatives down to earth in, a, in another setting the earlier the earlier data concern the number of minutes of daylight the time between sunrise and sunset in new york city on each day on the year in 2018 the relevant derivative in this context is the rate at which the data the dates lengthen or shorten from one day to the next on january on january 1 for instance the time from sunrise to sunset was 9 hours 90 minutes and 20 seconds 23 seconds on january it got a little longer 9 hours 20 minutes and 5 seconds that extra 40 seconds 42 seconds of the like equivalent to 0, 0.0 minutes was a measure of how rapidly the days were lengthening on part on the part on that part on that particular day of the year they were getting longer at a rate of, of about 10.7 minutes per day for comparisons for comparison consider the rate of the rate of change two week later on january on, on january 15 between the day and the next the, the amount of daylight increased by 10 to by 90 seconds corresponding to a to a rate of lengthening of one 1.5 minutes per day one more one more than more than twice more than twice of 0 0.0 0 0.7 meter two weeks years later two weeks earlier thus the days were not only lengthening on in January, they were lengthening faster with each passing day. This will come trend continue for the next several weeks. Daytime keep getting longer and did so more rapidly with the coming of swing. On the spring equinox, March 20, the rate of increasing top up at the glo at, at glorious 2.72 minutes of extra sunlight each day. You can spot that day on the earlier graph in chapter four. It's day seventy-nine about the chapter uh, about the chapter of the way in front and from the left, from where the wave or the length rises most steeply. That makes sense. When the graph is steepest, it's climbing more rapidly, which means the derivative is largest and the, the largest, and the days are rotating as quickly as possible. All of this happens of the first day of spring. For a melancholy contrast, consider the shortest days of the year. They pack a double warmy. In those dark days on winter, the days are not only depressing short, depressingly short, they also they also do not change from much one day to the next, which only adds to the top of. But this also makes sense. The shortest the shortest days occur at the bottom of the wave of the length. And at the bottom, the wave is flat. Otherwise, it will be at the bottom. It will be improving or worsening. But because it, but because it is a flat at bottom, it, its derivative is zero there, which means its rate of change grinds to a halt, and at least momentarily. On the on this like that, it can feel like spring will will, will never come. I've like I I've, I've highlighted two times of year that have a personal meaning of main for, for many of us around around the spring equinox and the winter solstice but it's even more instructive to consider the link as a whole the, to consider the year as a whole to take the seasonal variations in the rate of change of, of the link i've computed it at, at periodic intervals throughout the year starting on january 1 and containing every two weeks after that the results are plotted in the graph below.
the vertical axis shows the daily rate of change that is decimal minutes of daylight from one day to the next the horizontal axis shows what day it is with the day number from 1 january 1 to 30 365 december 31 the rate of change bobs and bobs up and down like a wave it starts out it starts out positive in the late winter and early spring when the days are getting longer and peaks around day 70, uh, 79 the spring equinox March, March 20 as we already, as we already know that's when the days are, length, are lengthening most rapidly around 2.72 minutes per day but after that it's uh, down it's all downhill the red the red starts to drop and goes negative after the summer solstice on day 172 june 21 it becomes negative because the days start shortening then the next day has fewer hours of daylight than the current one the red bottoms are the red bottoms out september 2022 when the light when the light is fading fastest and it stay and it stays negative but not as negative until the winter solstice on day 355 december 21 when the day starts getting start getting longer again even if imperceptibly it's fascinating to compare this wave to the wave we met earlier in chapter 4 when when they are plotted that when they are plotted together as a result to have comparable aptitudes here's here's what they look like i'm showing to use words of data here to emphasize the repetitiveness of the waves and to heighten the comparison between them i've also connected the dots and removed the number the numbers from the vertical axis to focus one more attention on the waves shape and timing the first time the first thing to notice is that the waves are out of sync of sync they do not peak simultaneously the wave of day length peaks around halfway to the year whereas its rate of change peaks about three three months earlier earlier the the, amount, the amounts to a quarter of a cycle earlier given to each wave takes 12 months to complete its up and down movement the other things the, the, the other thing to notice is that the waves resemble each other with slight differences although they so clear they so clear primary ties the dust wave is le is less symmetrical than the one solid one and it speaks through the to a flat truth a flatter i'm going into all this because this real world this real world waves over a glimpse as true a glass study of remarkable property of sine waves namely with a variable follows as perfect sine wave pattern its rate of change is also a perfect sine wave at wave time a quarter of a cycle ahead this self-regeneration property is unique to sine waves no other kinds of wave have it it could even be a, it could even be taken as a definition of sine waves in the sense of data hint at a marvelous phenomenon of rebirth in higher and perfect sine waves we will have more to say about this when it comes up again in connection with Fourier analysis a powerful sort of a powerful of sort of calculus that has led to some of its most exciting applications today let me give let me try to give you some insight into into where the color circle safe comes from the same concept uh, why why sine waves became sine waves when we compute the rate of change the rates of change the key is that sine the key is that sine waves are connected to uniform circular motion recall that when a point moves around a cycle at a constant speed its up and down motion trace a sine wave in a time from that matter so does its left and right motion with that in mind consider the diagram below
it shows a point moving clockwise around a cycle. The point is not supposed to represent anything physical or astronomical. It's not the earth orbiting the sun and that and it, and it does not have anything to do with the seasons. It's just an abstract point moving around a cycle. It is what displacement or steadiness for the sun increasing and decrease, decreases like a sine wave. When the point reaches it, when the point reaches its maximum steadiness, a sun in the diagram. That's analogous. That's analogous to the maximum of a sine wave or, lo or the longest day of the year. The question is. Where the point is the maximally east and the sine wave is at its peak eastiness, what, happen, what happens next? As the diagram shows, at its easternmost point, the point heads south as indicated by downward row, but south is 90 degrees away from east on the compass and 90 degrees is, is a cut of cycle. Aha! That's that's where the character cycle of set comes from. Because the geometry of a cycle, there's always a character cycle of set between any sine wave and the wave derived from its from it as its derivative. Its rates of change. In this analogy, the point's direction of travels is like its rate of change. It determines where the point where the point will go next and hence how it changes its location. Moreover, this compass heading the this compass heading of the row of the row itself rotates in the cycle in the circular fashion at the constant speed as the point goes around the cycle. So the compass heading of the row follows a sine wave pattern in time. And since the compass heading is like the rate of change, voila the rate of change follows a sine wave Pattern two. That's the that's the self regeneration property where we were trying to understand. Sine waves we get sine wave sine waves we can we get sine waves with a ninety degree shift. Experts will re, will realize that I am trying to explain with formulas why the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function, which is itself just a sine function shifted by a quarter cycle. By a similar 90 degrees phase lag occurs in other oscillating systems. When the pendulum swings back and forth, its speed, its speed is at its maximum when it goes through its bottom, whereas its leg is angle is at maximum a quarter cycle later, the pen, later, later when the pendulum is farther to the right, a graph of the a graph of the angle versus time and the, the speed versus time shows transposimate sine waves oscillating out of phase by 90 degrees. Another example comes from the from a simplified models of predator prey interactions in, in biology. Imagining imagine a population of sharks preying on population of speed of speed of fish. When the fish are at, at their maximum population level the subpopulation goes at its maximum rate because there are so many fish to eat. The subpopulation continues to climb and reaches its own maximum level a cut cycle later, by which by which time the fish population has dropped, having having been preyed on on severely a quarter cycle earlier. As an analysis of this model shows that the two population oscillates oscillate out of phase by 90 degrees. Similar predator prey oscillations are seen, are, are seen as well in nature, for example, in, uh, in annual fluctuations of Canadian hair and lynx population, and lynx populations as recorded by food trapping companies in 1800s. One Though the real explanation for those oscillations is doubtedly more complicated, as is often the case in biology, returning to the day length data, we see that, alas, they are not perfect. They are not perfect sine waves. They are also inherently discrete set of points, just one per day, 
with no they, with no data existing in between. As such, they do not provide the sort of continuum of points that calculus insists on. So, for our final example of of a derivative, let's turn to the let's turn to a case when we can co where we can collect data with as much resolution as we like, right down to the millisecond. Derivatives as internal speeds. The evening of August the August 16. The evening of August 16, 2009, was window in Beijing. At 10.30, the eighth fastest man in the world lined up for the Olympic finals of the 100-meter dash. One of them, a 21-year-old a, a Jamaican sprinter named Usain Bolt, was a relative newcomer to this event, known more as a 200-meter man. He'd be get hit back his coach for years to let him try running to the shorter race and over the past and over the past year he'd become very good very good at it. He didn't look like the the other sprinters. He was gangly six six feet five inch one one point nine one point nine six meters tall with a long Loping stride. As a boy, he had focused on soccer and kick and cricket until his cricket coach noticed his speed and suggested that he try out for track. As, the, as a teenager, he kept improving as a runner, but he never took the sport or himself too seriously. He was goofy and mischievous and had a fondness for practical jokes. On that night in Beijing, after all the athletes had been introduced and finished mugging for the TV cameras, the stadium got quiet. The sprinters placed them placed their feet in the blocks and coach into position. No, an official call out on your marks set and they fired the starting pistol. Bolt shot out Bolt shot out of the blocks but not quite as explosively as the other Olympians. His slow reaction time left him seventh out of eight near the start, gaining speed. By, third me by 30 meters, he moved up to the, to the middle of the, pack of the pack. Then, still accelerating like a ballot train, he put the light between himself and the rest of the field. At 80 meters, he glanced to his right to see where his main competitors were. Where his main competitors were. When he realized how far ahead he was, he slowed down visibly, dropped his arms to his sides, and slapped his, and slapped his chest as he crashed across the, fight, the finish line. Some commentators saw this as bragging. Others gleeful celebration, but in any case, Paul clearly didn't feel the need to run hard at the end, which led to speculation about about just how fast he could have run. As it was, even with his celebration and untied sock solace, he set a new world record of 9.69 seconds. One official criticized him for being unsportsmanlike. Unsportsmanlike. But Bolt did, didn't mean any disrespect, as he later told his report, reports, That's just me, I like to have fun, just stay relaxed. How fast did he run? Well, 100 meters in 9.69 seconds translated to 100 over 9.69 equals 10.32 meters, meters per second. In more family in more family units, that's about 337 kilometers per hour or 23 miles per hour. But that but this was his average speed over the whole race. He went slower than he went slower than at the beginning and end faster than 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 that in the middle. More detailed information is available from, from his speed times recorded every 10 meters down, down the track. He covered that the first 10 meters in 
1.83 seconds, corresponding to an average speed of 5.46 meters per second. There, his fastest speed, his fastest speed is at at at, at 50 at 50 to 60 meters, 60 to 70 meters, 6, 70 to 80 meters. He blasts throughout the 10, 10 meter sections in 0, 0 0.82 seconds each, second each for an average speed of 12.2 meters per second in the final 10 meters. He, when he is up and broke from, he, he decelerated to an average speed of 11.1 meters per second. Human beings have evolved to spot patterns, so instead of pouring over dumbbell like we've just been we've just been doing, it's usually more informative to visualize to visualize them. The following graph shows the lapse time the, the, lapse, the lapse times at which board cost 10 meters, 10, 20 meters, 30, 30 meters, and so on, up to the 9.69 seconds it took him to cross the finish line at the 100 meters 100 meter mark. I've connected the dots with straight lines as, as guide to the to the eye, but keep in mind that only the dots are real data. Together, the dots and the line segments between them form a polygonal curve. The slopes of the segments are slowest on the left, corresponding to what's lower speed at the start of the race. They bend upward as they move to the right. That he's that means he's accelerating. Then they join to form a daily straight line, indicating the high and steady speed that he maintained for most of the race. It's natural to wonder at what time he was running his absolute fastest and where on the track that occurred. We know that his fast average speed over a 10 meter, 10 meter section occurred somewhere between 50 and 80 meters, but an average speed over 10 meters is not quite what we want. We are interested in his peak speed. Imagine that Usain Bolt was bearing a speedometer. At what precise moment was he running the fastest, and exactly how fast that was? How fast was that? What we're looking for here is a way of measuring his instantaneous speed. The concept, se the concept seems almost paradoxical. At any instant, Usain Bolt was at precisely one place. He was frozen as in a, as in a snapshot. So what would it mean to speak of his speed at, at that instant? Speed can only occur over a time interval, not in a single instant. The enigma, is ent the enigma of instantaneous speed goes far back in in the in the story of mathematics and philosophy to around 40, 450 BCE, with Zeno in his redoptable paradoxes. Recall that in his paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, Zeno claimed that the, that Zeno claimed that the faster runner could never overtake a slower runner, despite the what you said both proof what the night, despite what you said both proof at night in Beijing. In the paradox of the arrow, Zeno argued that an arrow in flight could never move. Mathematicians are still unsure what point he was trying to make his paradoxes, but my guess is that the subs subtleties inherent in the notion of speed at an instant global Zeno, Aristotle, and other Greek philosophers. They uns they, their unseenness may explain why Greek mathematicians always had so little to say about motion and change. Like infinitely, like infinity, those unsophory topics seem to have been banished from polite conversation. 2000 years, 2000 years after Zeno, the founders of differential calculus solved the riddle of the new instantaneous speed. Their intuitive solution was to define instantaneous speed as a limit, specifically the limit of average speeds taken over shorter and shorter time intervals. It's like what we did when we zoom in the when we what we when we zoom in on the parabola. 
then we approximate a smaller and smaller piece of a smooth groove with a straight line. Then we ask what happens in the limit of infinite magnification by studying the limit value of the line slope. Line slope. We were able to define the derivative at the particular point of the smoothly curving parabola. Here, by analogy, we would like to approximate something changing, something changing smoothly in time. Usain Bolt's distance down the track. The idea is to replace the graph of his distance, distance versus time, with a polygonal curve, be changing at a constant average speed over short time intervals. If the average speed on its interval approaches a limit as those time intervals get shorter and shorter, that limiting value is what we mean by instantaneous speed at a given time, like slope at a point. Speed at an speed at an instant is a derivative. For all this to succeed, we have to assume his distance down the track very smoothly. Otherwise, the limit where investigation won't exist, and neither will the derivative. The result, the results won't approach anything sensible as the intervals get shorter. But did his instance actually very smoothly as a function of time? We do not. We don't know for sure. The only data we have are discrete samples of both elapsed, elapsed times at each of the 10, 10 meter mark, markers at, on the track to estimate his instantaneous speed. We need to be on, We need to go beyond the data and make a educated guess, guess about where he where he was at times in between those points. A systematic way to make such a guess is known as interpolation. The idea is draw, the idea is to draw a smooth curve between the data available. In other words, we want to connect the dots, not by straight line segments, as we've already done, but by the but by most possible smooth curves that goes through the dots, or at least that goes very close to them. The constants we impose on this curve are that it should be taught and not un and not undulate too much, it should, pass at, it should pass as close to all the dots as possible, and it should so and it should so that Bolt's initial speed was zero, since we know he was motionless when he was in the cross position. There are many different curves that meet that meet this criteria. Statisticians have devised a host of techniques for fitting smooth curves of the data. Of of all them give of all all of them give similar results and since them involve a bit guess what anyway let's not bother too much about which one to use here's one example of a smooth curve that meets all the requirements or all the requirements since the curve is smooth by design we can calculate its derivative at every point the resulting graph gives gives us as an estimate of Sain Bolt's velocity at each point instant of his record setting rest that night in Beijing. It indicates that Bolt's reach it, indi it indicates that Bolt reach a uh, reach a uh, top speed of around 12.3 meters per second at about the three quarter point in the rest. Until the until then he'd been accelerating, gaining speed at each every at each moment. After that, he decelerated so much, so much so that his speed dropped to 10.1 meter per, meters per second as he crossed the finish line. The graph, com the graph confirms what the we once saw, both saw, both saw slowed down dramatically near the end, especially in the last 20 meters when he re when he relaxed and celebrated. The, the next year. At the 2009 World, Champion in World, Champ World Championships in Berlin, Bolt put an end to the speculation about how fast he could go. No chest thumps this time. He ran, he ran, he ran hard to the finish and started his Beijing World Record of 9.69 seconds with an, if, if, with an even more astonishing time of 9.58 second, seconds. Because of the great anticipation surrounding this event, biomechanical researchers work on hand with laser guns, similar to the radar guns used by 
used by police to catch speeders. These high-tech in instruments allowed the, allowed the researchers to miss the, the sprinter's positions a hundred times a second. When they computed balls in sun use speed, that is what they found. These little wiggles on the overall trend on the overall trend represent the ups and downs in speed that inevitably occur during during strides. Running, after all, is a series of leapings and landings. Both speed both speed change a little whenever he lands the foot on the ground and momentarily break and that propelled his, himself forward and launched himself airborne again. Intriguing as they are, these little wiggles are annoying and bothersome to a data analyst. What we really wanted to see was the ten, not the wiggles. And for the purpose, the early approach of, of fitting a smooth curve to the data was ju was just as good as was as good and arguably better. After connecting at that, uh, after connecting all that high resolution data and observing the wiggles, the researchers had to clean them off. They had to clean them off anyway. They filtered them out to unmask the more unmeaning the, to unmask the more meaningful trend. To me, these wiggles hold a larger lesson. Lesson, I see them as a metaphor, a kind of instruction. Instructional fable about the nature of modeling real phenomena with calculus. If we try to push the resolution of our measurements too far, if we look at any phenomenon in, in excruciatingly fine detail in time or space, we, we will start to see a breakdown of smoothness. In Usain Bolt speed data, the wiggles took a smooth trend and make it look as bushy as a pipe cleaner. The same thing would happen with any form of motion if we could measure if we could measure it at the at the mo molecular scale. Down at the le uh, down at that level, motion be motion becomes jitterly and far from smooth. Calculus will no longer have much to tell us, at least not directly. Yet if what we care about are the overall tense. Smoothing out the jitters may be good enough. The enormous insight that calculus has given us into the nature of motion and change and change it and change in this universe is a testament to the power of smoothness, approximate though it may be. There's one uh, there's one last reason lesson here in mathematical modeling. As in all of science, we always have to make choice about what to stress and what to ignore. The art of abstraction lies in knowing what is essential and what is minutia, what is signal and what is noise, what is trend and what is wiggle. It's an abstract, it's an art, because such cons because such co such choice such such choices always involve an element of danger. They come close to wishful thinking and intellectually dishonesty. The greatest scientists like Galileo and Kepler somehow managed managed to walk along the precipice. Art, say Picasso, is a lie that makes us really stood. The same could be said for calculus as a mode of nature. In the first half of the 17th century, calculus began to use as a powerful abstraction of motion and change. In the second half of that century, the same kinds of artistic choices, the lies that reveal the truth, prepared the way for a revolution.